How can we make emptiness a practice for ourselves? In the early Buddhist texts, the Buddha discusses a one such practice in particular, a, a deep and profound and interesting practice, which we'll discuss today. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute, that's onlinedharma.org. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to the channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. And also, if you're interested in a, in a deeper dive into the material, the Dharma of early Buddhism, check out my courses over at onlinedharma.org. What we'll be discussing today is a meditation that's called uh, the Liberation of Mind by Emptiness, or Sunyata Chetavimutti, which is a, a specific uh, practice that the Buddha outlines in the early texts, and we'll, we'll get to those in a minute. What I, should, what I, what I want to begin with, though, is to say that there, that there are various different practices that we might consider emptiness practices in early Buddhism. Uh, there is, of course, the understanding that all meditation is, a sense, in a sense, a meditation on emptiness, because all meditation involves emptying ourselves out of the ordinary cares of lay life, of daily life, of putting ourselves into a renunciant position, we're renun renouncing certain things in order to sit quietly for a time, and that itself is a kind of emptiness practice. Also, in a more general sense, the Buddha suggests uh, in a sutta uh, that it's when a mendicant or a monastic has gone to a wilderness or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut and reflects like this, this is empty of a self or what belongs to a self. So more specifically, emptiness is a practice of non-self, of becoming aware of non-self, of the changeable nature of who we are and the fact that all of our supposed ownership is only conventional in a sense. It isn't real. If you haven't seen my earlier video on the doctrine of emptiness, I'll put a link to it down below where I get into more of what emptiness really meant in early Buddhism, but I'll take that for, for red right now. Now, what we're going to do here, however, is to get into a more a, a deeper, I think, more profound uh, uh, meditations on emptiness, or a more profound practice that gets us into a meditation on emptiness. And it's not perhaps the sort of thing that we're going to want to do in our daily lives, although you'll have to decide that for yourselves, because it would probably take quite a while to do. It would take quite a bit of dedication. But even if we're not going to actually practice what I discuss in this video coming up, uh, nevertheless, I think we can use it uh, as pointers towards practice which is just as important. We can take ideas from it that might, I think, help our daily practice, even if we're not going to get into the depths of what, what the Buddha suggests. And in this respect, there are a couple of early texts that are key for the Buddhist practice, the Buddhist suggestion of practice of emptiness. They're called the Shorter and the Longer Discourses on Emptiness, or Shorter and Greater Discourses. And what we'll be discussing today is called the Shorter Discourse on Emptiness. Now, when I say that there's two of these, it's important to keep in mind that oftentimes these are translated shorter and greater discourses, and, and some people may mistake them to mean that the greater discourse is more important or deeper. And that's not the case. In, in early Buddhism, there's oftentimes two discourses with similar themes, and the shorter one is going to be called the shorter one, and the greater or longer one is going to be called the greater or longer one. It's simply an issue of length, not an issue of importance. That said, uh, just to say a couple of words about the greater discourse or longer discourse on emptiness. In that one, uh, it, it's, it's got a lot of complication. It's, it's a little bit too much for me to go into in one video. It's less, it's, it's, it's less of a sort of a, a direct, straightforward kind of, of, of sutta. But the basic idea there is that if we want to pursue awakening, we should avoid gregariousness and seek seclusion. So it begins with the Buddha... Uh, coming into a group of monastics who were very gregarious with each other, who were engaged in discussion and perhaps backslapping and laughing or whatever it might be at that time of the day. And the Buddha basically uh, is stern with them and says that, you know, if you're going to be gregarious, you're really not going to be able to pursue the path properly. That the path is a path of renunciation. The path is a path of seclusion rather than gregariousness. And this is a rather hard message for, for some of us to take. And uh, it's sort of, uh, it, it's, but it's a sort of thing that's worth reading if you want to read it. Today, however, we're going to be dealing with a more specific meditation 
the, a meditation practice that we can do, uh, which is outlined in the shorter discourse. And this discourse uh, recommends a meditation that the Buddha says he often abides in. It's the kind of meditation that he really uh, enjoys and likes and, and abides in a lot. And, and not only that, but, he's, but uh, Sariputta as well in a separate text says the same. He says that he too, and Sariputta I should say is the Buddha's, as you might say, right-hand disciple, the disciple who is best known for wisdom, who's the, the foremost in wisdom. And Sariputta as well abides in this emptiness meditation. And the Buddha describes it as the meditation of a great person. It's the kind of uh, really exalted kind of meditation state that really we should be searching for if we want to be looking towards awakening. And where does it begin? Well, it begins, uh, the Buddha describes it, he's, he's surrounded here by monastics, and he says, consider yourselves uh, empty of uh, the village, empty of village life. It's only us monastics here, there are no uh, 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 lay people, there's no uh, lay concerns, we've all given those up. And then he turns from that to uh, th their surroundings. They're sitting in uh, probably a clearing in the forest. And he says, from here what we're going to do is attend to uh, the forest. And, and what we're going to try to do in this, at the beginning of this meditation is to unify our mind around a perception of forest. Now, perception of forest should be taken, I, th I think at least, uh, it's not clear from the text, but my speculation is somewhat indirectly, that is to say, the monastics probably would have had their eyes closed, so they weren't looking at the forest, but they were perceiving it perhaps through their ears, the sounds of the forest, through their minds, they were conceiving of the forest around them, um, a mental image of the forest that surrounded them, and the idea was that in doing so, they would be emptying their minds, again, further, as we said before, of the ordinary cares of life. They were emptying their minds of being in the, in the village or the town, or we might say today the city. Emptying their minds of uh, the hurly-burly of ordinary life, uh, of walking and, and uh, carrying water and washing and all the ordinary things that monastics would have had to do. And simply uh, emptying our minds of all of that, we were uh, unifying our mind around this perception of this unity of force, this kind of uh, uh, perception, in our, a mental perception of this kind of calm forest. And in so doing, we are calming our minds. We're becoming calmer, we're becoming, the mind is becoming emptier, the mind is uh, becoming more peaceful. However, the Buddha says that when we do this, we'll become aware that there is still subtle, a sort of a subtle disturbance in the mind. And this disturbance is brought about by, by our perception of forest. Because the forest, our perception of forest, is, is changeable, is kind of mutable. We perhaps can pick out particular trees in our mind, or we hear the sounds that come and go, or the, the rustling of the leaves. So in this sense, our meditation is is empty. It's an emptiness meditation. It's empty of what's not there. It's empty of the village. It's empty of ordinary concerns. But it's not empty of forest. So we turn from that meditation on forest to a different meditation, the Buddha says. We turn from that to a meditation on earth. And we have to be careful here because our ordinary conception of earth is of something uh, quite varied. We have hills and valleys and streams and all the rest. But the Buddha says, he gives a simile. He says, think of earth the way we might think of the hide of a bull that has been, um, that we're making into leather, let's say, and we're, we've pegged it out around the edges with a hundred pegs in the ground. And those pegs stretch out this hide until it becomes absolutely flat and uniform. And in the same way, he says, we should think of earth as entirely flat and uniform, like a, a flat patch of earth and ground. And he says, that's the idea of earth we should have in this meditation. So we turn our mind from a meditation on forest to a meditation on this kind of flat, uniform earth. And he says that this meditation, we'll notice, is even emptier, it's even calmer, it's even more peaceful, it's even more unified. In other words, we're able to unify our perception around, or unify our mind, I should say, around this perception of of, of, of earth. 
And he says it's even subtler than Forrest because it, it lacks, let's say, we could say, he doesn't say this, but we can understand it. It lacks the motion of the trees and the distinction between one tree and another and different colors of trees and the sound of the trees. And we're left simply with the, the silent earth, this kind of a uniform kind of uh, earth. However, the Buddha says that when we do this, Oh, we'll notice that the mind is even emptier, has, has emptied itself out further, but we're still left with a residue of a kind of subtle disturbance. And this is a subtle disturbance brought about by our perception of earth, which still involves a kind of subtle mental disturbance. Perhaps the, the connotations that earth has in our minds, perhaps the, the difference in the, in the grains that we conceive of in that earth, because again, we're probably doing this with our eyes closed, so this is probably a mental kind of perception. So, but then how do we move from that to something even subtler, even emptier? The Buddha suggests we then turn our meditation from a meditation on this uniform earth to a meditation on infinite space. That is to say, we, as it were, we remove the earth from our mind and we're left simply with the space that the earth was uh, occupying, basically. And we consider this space to be infinite in all directions, and it's, it's endless space. And this perception, this, this unity of mind that we're able to perceive or able to reach is even more unified. It's even subtler, it's even calmer than our meditation on earth. It's something that gets us even deeper into a meditation on emptiness because, again, we're, we're emptying the mind out of various things. We've emptied it out of ordinary life, of, of trees and forest, of earth. Now we're simply left with space. Now, this meditation is also known as the first of the formless attainments, which are called the formless attainments in early Buddhism. And these are four meditative attainments. Um, this is the first of them again, that are not dependent upon any kind of perception of form. We've just removed form, physical form, out of the equation here because we're simply dealing with space. Um, and uh, I did an earlier video on those four attainments. I'll put a link to that also in the show notes uh, below if you want to hear more about those. I can't go into them in great detail here, but, but you get the idea. And once again, we wonder perhaps how do we get to a, a subtler and a calmer and a, uh, an even more empty uh, and even less dis with, with fewer disturbances kind of uh, uh, mental state than the than one we were just in. Well, the Buddha says, uh, we go to the second of the formless attainments, which is a meditation on, on consciousness itself, on infinite consciousness. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking this uh, conception of infinite space, uh, which we're conceiving of, and we turn the mind's eye back on itself. So we leave space behind. We empty the mind out of a, th a perception of, of infinite space, and we simply uh, turn the mind back to itself, and we simply sp then spend time on a, uh, a meditation on consciousness itself. But even this, the Buddha says, involves very subtle disturbances involved in consciousness, in, in conceiving of our own consciousness, in perceiving our own consciousness. So where do we turn from here? We turn instead now to the, what's called the base of nothingness, from the base of consciousness to the base of nothingness. And the base of nothingness is uh, the third of these uh, formless attainments. It's one where we essentially empty the mind out of, out of our own consciousness, out of consciousness, out of this infinite consciousness, and we're left with a, a perception, if you like, of nothingness, uh, which is a very subtle, obviously, a subtle kind of perception. Now, this particular meditative state is the state that uh, the Buddha's early teacher before he became awakened, Alara Kalama, his early meditation teacher seems to have believed, or he, the Buddha claims, believed was equivalent to awakening. So before the Buddha himself became awakened, he undertook a number of different very uh, deep meditative practices. Uh, one of these, as I say, was this meditation on nothingness. And Alara Kalama, his teacher, believed that was the end of the path, that once you had achieved this, there was no further you could go. The Buddha rejected that, believed that the, this meditation was simply a way station, it was perhaps a practice that would be helpful in certain respects, but was not itself awakening. So, so what we're left with, therefore, is this meditation on emptiness. 
And where do we go from here? What is even more subtle than a meditation on emptiness? What could, what could possibly be more subtle? Well, here we have uh, what may be in this text, in the shorter discourse on emptiness, an interpolation. That is to say, something that wasn't originally there that has been added. Now, up until now, I haven't been paying too close an attention to the exact wording of each of these because it hasn't really been that critical how we precisely word them. But in this case, it becomes, I think, important. Indeed, what the Buddha says here is that once you get into this state, uh, this, this uh, meditation on neither perception nor non-perception, he says that the meditator becomes aware that this is empty of everything except the unity dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. The unity dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. That is, only this kind of meditative uh, perception is present in our minds, this unity around this. And I think maybe you can see the problem. Uh, the scholar Johannes Bronckhorst has pointed out that this particular meditative attainment doesn't make a whole lot of sense because he's saying that there's a perception of a state that doesn't involve perception. By definition, it's neither perception nor non-perception. So the description of the state that we're given in the shorter discourse in emptiness uh, doesn't really compute. It doesn't really make sense. And the, the great scholar of early Buddhism and a person who is known for comparing Chinese and and, and Pali recensions of these texts, uh, Analyo, a, a contemporary monastic, he points out in one of his papers that, uh, very interestingly, this particular part of the sutta doesn't exist in the Chinese or the Tibetan recensions of this text. That is to say, in neither of those other recensions do we have mention of a meditation on the base of neither perception nor non-perception. So this particular move in this, in this meditation probably was interpolated wrongly by somebody within the Pali tradition, that they just passed on to the next and the, the fourth uh, of these uh, 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 formless attainments and just added it in after the third one. Uh, but it doesn't always have to be that way. There are other texts in which we only have the first three. So uh, it, it does look like something that doesn't belong in this text uh, for the reasons that Johannes Bronckhorst pointed out. So, but then what, what do we have? If we don't have that, what is the next step after this, our meditative state where we're simply dealing with nothingness? And in all of the texts, we then have another stage, which is a turning of the mind, if you like, because in, the, in all the prior stages of this, this uh, practice of meditation, we've been dealing with perceptions of various kinds, unifying the mind around certain perceptions. Um, perceptions of, of forest, perceptions of, of earth, perceptions of uh, space, of consciousness, and so on. But now we're going to turn from those perceptions. The, I think the idea being we've gotten down to, with the perception of nothingness, we've gotten down to a, a perception that's so subtle that we really can't do anything more with perception as such. So we turn the mind to a meditative state which is called animitta ceto samadhi, or the signless concentration of mind. Now, what exactly this meditative state is, is something of a question. It's not well described in the Pali suttas. In the commentaries, the commentarial tradition, it's understood to be a meditative attainment that's based around insight rather than around calming. That is to say that when we have insight into the nature of phenomena, we can gain this kind of uh, signless concentration of mind. Uh, but what I would say in a, a more general sense is that signless basically means that we're no longer attending to a perception, if you like, anymore, because uh, perception works with signs, with the, with the symbols, with the, with the perceived parts of things. So what perception does is to, is to look around us or conceive around ourselves and take the signs that surround us. What is a sign of uh, a car has wheels and a door and so on. These are the signs, these are the symbols, these are the aspects, if you like, of reality. And when we're going to a different kind of thinking where we're signless, we're, we're not attending to the, 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 these kinds of, of, of parts of things, we're sort of giving up perception entirely. 
if you like, this is a kind of substitute for neither perception nor non-perception. We're no longer dealing in, in perceptual ideas, but we're, we're dealing more in sort of a, an insight type of, uh, of meditation. So this is a meditation where we're leaving the perceived or conceived aspects of the world behind. And the Buddha says that once we get into this meditation, uh, in, in all the previous cases, the, the main concern at the end of them is that we see a subtle disturbance in the mind. And the subtle disturbance is dependent upon the particular perception we're dealing with, whether it's, uh, again, whether it's forest or earth or whatever. In this one, the Buddha says, once we've left behind all of this, once we've emptied the mind of all of this, the only disturbance left is the disturbance that comes about because we are in a living body, because we still have functioning uh, perceptual apparatus, if you like. So that is the only disturbance that the Buddha says is left when we're in this signless concentration of mind, mental state. And the Buddha also says that from here we can attain awakening directly if we understand in a deep, deep sense that even this, the most exalted kind of uh, uh, meditative state, or one of the most exalted sorts of meditative states, even this is conditional. Even this is volitionally produced. Even this is not itself awakening. If we can understand that, then we can du directly go to awakening from there. But in any event, this particular meditative practice where we empty the mind out of everything, of all perception, and we end up in this state of animitta cetu samadhi, of, of signless concentration of mind, that the Buddha calls the supreme, the unexcelled, uh, uh, emptiness meditation. There is, he, the Buddha says, there's no greater meditation on emptiness than this one. He further says that anybody who's doing emptiness meditation in the past or the future or at any time or place, if they're doing the, the best one, they're going to be doing this one. Th there is no greater, which is a quite a, a strong statement to make. But I think the point is that once we've gotten to the stage where the only disturbance in the mind, the only non-empty, if you like, problem, the only thing in the mind that's left is simply whatever is a, a residue of our being alive, that there's no further that we can go. And now I think the question you may be left with is, this is all well and good and maybe interesting, you may find it fascinating, but how do we put this into our lives? And I think the, the place to begin with all of this is a practice of equanimity that's reached through sense restraint. Because we're not going to get to this sort of deep state of, uh, of signlessness very easily. But we can begin there along the road by restraining the senses, and not by, by not allowing our senses to go too far in certain respects. And the Buddha has a, a practice, around, lots of detailed practices around that, which are, I think, a more of a beginning way that we can sort of begin the, this path. And I have a video on that, which I'll put up on the screen. I'd suggest taking a look at it, uh, putting it into your practice. Thanks so much to you all. I hope we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you be well.